Hey, what's up, guys? This book here, man. I remember back in the day, right? Back in the 90s, uh, I was uh, uh, very left wing, very resentful. A lot of some, I had some hard knocks that had, uh, you know, it made me like turn my back on the world essentially. And I used to go to the uh, Grand Army Plaza, the library there. I was taking this book out like 12 times. Uh, and you're thinking, why didn't you just buy it? And I'm like, well, you didn't, it wasn't in the store, so you didn't buy it, right? <laughs> you know? You could have mail ordered it, but I just I I liked I, had, I liked going to the library on my days off. Um, uh, it took a very dark turn, let's say. Uh, this book, David J. Scott, he is essentially probably the best writer about horror and culture, okay. Um, and he takes a very historicist approach. There's things in this book that he mentioned that really spoke to me back then uh, in terms of. Uh, the, the impact of the wars, okay, the wars which we are we are all still living in the slow bleed off from. Uh, I never had uh, heard a, a writer mention that uh, really back then, at least in any kind of mainstream sense. I'm sure there was others that did, but he really had nailed it to me. Okay, the very experiences that that had essentially slowly destroyed uh, one side of my family. Uh, which was the cause of some of the issues I was talking about, uh, really shown home in here. Even though, of course, his view of, of that time is, is pretty pedestrian, as you'd say. Um, but uh, remember, to the original cover, was, it was an Edward Gorey cover. This is a very campy cover. Okay? I don't like it as much. Uh, and of course, there's a reason why David J. Scott is a you know, openly gay liberal. <laughs> okay? uh, and there's, you know, there's... there's, there's what you would call a queer subtext in some of this stuff, but but not a lot. The guy is not a pigeonhole like that. He's about, you know, history and culture, uh, and it's uh, he goes pretty much chronologically in this. Okay, going through the you know the aftermath of the first war into the thirties, right? The depression into the the second war into the fifties, uh, America, right? Into then the sixties and seventies, all the upheavals. Uh, the the eighties, you know, the the craziness of the eighties, and uh, this book ended in the nineties. Now, looking at this book now, it's very interesting to me. Well, back when this came out, uh, you know, obviously it was the nineties. Okay, I think this edition came out in ninety seven, a couple of years later. Uh, in the context of now, okay, the real horror that was waiting in the wings, as we can see now. Sort of puts, makes this book, I don't know, I wouldn't say a misdirection, but it sort of puts it as like an earlier chapter that was open-ended. Well, now we know the the ending, and the ending, okay, although it never really ends, but the ending is nothing like we thought it would be. Although, for some people, you, you could have seen how it ended, okay? In some ways, I, I was on the right path, let's say, back then, but I had been diverted by a number of things. But regardless... I'll cover it in here just, you know, some of the things I like about it. Uh, I guess the things that I mentioned that are, I think are unique to him. Okay? The whole concept of your modern horror comes out of your 19th century literature movements, you know, and to a degree your artistic movements, which you would call modernism, okay? naturalism, realism. Of course, the decadent movement I keep mentioning uh, you know, movements, they're not like super tight scenes or anything like that, but, uh, you know, Emil Zola, right? Uh, the uh, the artist's role was cold and reductionist. Clinical detachment, of course, has always been a good cover for morbidity and sadism. And the most unsavory aspects of naturalism were carried to the furthest and most influential expression in a deceptively modest venue, right? The Grand Gounal, none of the stories were supernatural. They were literally realist stories, right? I guess you would call them true crime. Okay, but the whole idea that things were not, things were not probably going to be as good as as others had said, and it only gets carried off later into what happens in the early twentieth century, which is to say, what do I keep bringing up? The wars. Okay. Um, you know, here's a line here. Hold on. He covers here this one, like the black cat. I remember when I had this book had come out. I had never seen the black cat. The Black Cat has. If you haven't seen this movie, okay, and you're a horror fan, and, and you're you know you like you, you you can deal. Listen, I'm talking to you know mature horror people that can watch black and white movies or whatever. The Black Cat is like is heads and tails above the rest aesthetically. The sadism in it, the Poe connection. These guys are World War One veterans who have a grudge with each other. 
uh, and you know the architecture. It really is. Uh, and apparently, it was shot in 19 days for less than ninety-six thousand dollars. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Um. Oh, James Whale. Uh, the ironic sensibility known as camp. Is that what that is? I thought it was British guys dressing up as old ladies. <laughs> no, actually, James Whale. I'm, uh, what's interesting to him about uh, what's interesting about him to me was that the guy was a POW in World War One and apparently had been really struck uh, by war trauma and uh, made a, a realistic war film. Okay, all the the can't be fun aside, uh, he he apparently was deadly serious about portraying war in his uh, in the movie that he had made. But uh, you know. Obviously, uh, that's uh, it's not as po a popular thing as the other thing about him, right? Yeah. Yeah, look at that, Brooklyn Heights. <laughs> uh, we go through the war. Now, I only really want to get over here. like, uh. And really, too, the original book had much better paper. This is like cheap paper. Uh, Bella Lugosi's dead. Uh. Or Bella. Oh, I was wrong. All right, Nietzsche. Nietzsche got mentioned as a joke, I guess. Right, here we go. This is the thing. Uh, this sums up so much of, uh, you know, the, the the themes I get across right, in these goings down of the sun. Right? Uh, the new American prosperity of the early 50s was one atop the largest bone pile in human history. World War II had claimed the lives of over 40 million soldiers, and try 60 million soldiers, and civilians had introduced radical forms of mechanized death. I'm not going to get into the rest. Uh, he's got the, pretty much the, the established view of that, but there's no getting around that Europe had been annihilated, Okay, that millions of people had been displaced, destroyed, traumatized, uh, and that America, America, was now on top. Okay. Because, you know, the rest of the world was either bombed into the Stone Age or taken over by, you know, the Soviet Union. And so, on the side here, I thought this was interesting, all right? You want to talk about a segue to, uh, you know, comic books, right? The circulation figures for comic books during the early 50s are impressive even today. This is written in 93, right? In 1950, 50 million comic books were being printed and distributed every month. Okay, and they're being read mostly by adults. So, uh, you know, uh, an interesting segue. But anyway, let's get back. You know, as the time goes on, we start to go into the monster kids, right? The monster kids I keep talking about. Uh, you know, the Monster Mash, these Aurora kits. Uh, let's see, there's something else here. I'm trying to, here we go. Oh, Francis Baker, but you know Francis Baker, right? Yeah, amazing, amazing artist. Uh, guy literally had no, no, like, what influence could he have? This literally, he invented this kind of craziness. Uh, and I just thought it was interesting. Uh, so as we go through here, you know, it's a lot, but that baby crazy. <laughs> Uh, we start to go into like the, the uh, you know the eighties and all the controversies, right? Here's the thing. Uh, there's a funny thing in here. I remember reading when I had read this. It's Tom Savini, right? He mentions his service in Vietnam, right? A death dream, man. The night Andy came home, bro. That is a powerful, creepy horror film, man. Uh, literally, uh, the love is it's Robinson Jeffers' The Love and the Hate as a you know as his own, as a movie. All right. I like that. Oh, interesting. But the 80s special effects in the popular media were the closest encounter with the miraculous that a secular culture could muster. He admits it was a secular culture. Okay? All your religious evangelists were, were literally on the way out. All right. but, uh, going through here, I just want to finish this up. I don't know why. You know, I like this. This is funny. Uh, January 91, the Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors at Midtown Manhattan. Remember going there? Right. Splatterpunk, right? The attendees are what Manhattanites. This is funny because this is a term you don't hear anymore because we're all God, pretty much. The attendees are what Manhattanites call br a bridge and tunnel crowd. Right? The monster troll connotation is duly noted. Working class, young, white. He brought this up uh, back then, even back then. All right. 
<laughs> Whatever working class rage is lurking here is content for the moment to feel an illusory gore. <laughs> uh, the weekend of heart is like a surrealist populist casino. Yeah, that is, that's I always like that point of phrase. So anyway, great book, great book. Uh, I want to finish it off here with something that I I swore that I don't remember, although I had written it down here. Where is it? I never read that book. So I never even saw I never even saw the movie. I, I know, right? Isn't that like kinda of, how dare me? How dare I not see that movie? Okay, here we go. Now I don't I don't think I got this from Camille Paglia, who I respect a lot actually. Uh, I don't think I got this from her, alright? I might have read this at some point, but I think I came to the, my own conclusions about horror in general, modern horror separately, okay? Uh, horror films are rituals of pagan worship. Right? That's what I'm saying. Horror is a pagan reflex. Okay, it's a pagan reflex, you know, uh, after Christianity, but mostly after the Enlightenment, because even Christians, uh, you know, ha Christians believed in the supernatural. Okay, but the Enlightenment, okay, whatever you want to think it comes out of, the Enlightenment separated the natural and the supernatural world. Horror is a pagan reflex. There's no, there's a reason why it started really with the Germans in terms of the, you know, the films. Right? Rituals of pagan worship. And the horror films uses rot, right? Decadence. You know, and horror is, is, is pagan and it is decadence. Right? The horror film uses rot as a primary material, part of the Christian West secret craving, or I could argue the Enlightenment secular West secret craving. For Dionysian truths, okay, uh, she's spot on, uh, and I, you know, this must have influenced me. I guess I, I had sort of come to that conclusion myself. A lot of it coming out of also with you know music and Lovecraft, but anyway, so uh, the book is recommended. Okay, um, this is the latest book I think he came out with. Um, not I didn't like this book as much, and look, man, look how big it is. Okay, well, obviously the the, uh, the queer subtext goes up to 12, okay, because uh, Bram Stoker was a, uh, a sycophant of Walt Whitman, okay, and for some reason, uh, Oscar Wilde is brought up a lot in this, okay, uh, look at that, yeah, dandy, he looks like a dork, right? <laughs> uh, but, but in terms of a, a very, uh, a snapshot of the time period that I was truly fascinated by, the fin de soleil, and of course the roots of horror uh, in that time. He really gets it across here, big time. Uh, the the uh, the fear, the specter of syphilis. Again, I'll bring it up. You know, uh, damn man, no wonder you turned out the way you did. What your mom did to you, bro? Anyway, just kidding, just kidding. Um. A great book on that. It really gets across that time period and everything going on with it. So for me, it was useful. Right? And it was Oscar Wilde's wife okay, and his son. I think he had two sons, and one of them was killed in the damn, you know, the Great War. Uh, it's a very sad ending. So, but um, you know, this book was useful to me. But like I said, maybe not as useful as much, just because you know he really turns up the. Uh, the queer thing up to, to 12 in this. But whatever. Uh, it's his book, right? He can do what he wants, right? Yeah. You say I'm a liberal. I really am. Apparently. So anyway. But uh, this this is the best book this guy ever did. Uh, it's recommended. Uh, if you can get the, the, the hard cover with the ever gory cover. With the better paper inside. Uh, I would recommend that. Uh... But uh, in general, you know, uh, I guess it's kind of like a, a historical document at this point because I'd like to see someone write a cultural history of horror of now uh, and with all that has transpired. Problem is, someone right now uh, couldn't get published. <laughs> you, you get me? All right. And the horror continues later.